Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to, to tonight's city council meeting of March 8th, 2021. I would like to ask the city clerk to please call the roll. Councillor McLaughlin. I'm here. Councillor Runyon. Here. Councillor Randall. Present. Councillor Richardson. Present. And Mayor Mays, I did see Councillor Long Curtis earlier, but I'm not seeing her now. Okay, I'm sure she'll show up presently. Um, and I'm here as well. Okay, next on the agenda. Next on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to ask Councillor McLaughlin to uh, please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item four on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? This is Randall. I move to approve the agenda, agenda as presented. I will second. This is McLaughlin. It's been moved by Councillor Randall and seconded by Councillor McLaughlin to approve the agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand or say aye. Aye. Uh, motion passes. Next on the agenda is presentations and proclamations. And first we have a special award to announce for the Fort Dales Museum. And their executive director, Cal Mc McDermott is here with us today. Um, you all have in your packet a certificate of recognition. I'd like to read it very quickly here. Congratulations on being the best in your field. The Fort Dallas Museum has been selected by the readers of True West Magazine as the, and I quote, the best preserved historic Fort of the West for 2021. This award is a testament to your hard work and tenacity to be the best in your category and recognized by the people that love the West. On behalf of the city council and the citizens of the Dallas, please accept our congratulations and sincere thanks for your dedication to preservation of our history. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. If you'd like to say a few words, go, uh, please proceed. I always like to say a few words. Mm -hmm. So it is an honor to be associated with the Fort Dallas Museum. It's just been a real uh, interesting challenge, uh, for the most part, very positive to take it. Uh, from where it was six years ago as to where it is today. But I also really want to thank all of those people from the very first people who started that museum in 1905, who had that vision way back then with no thought of, of cruise ships or freeways or anything like that to develop a, uh, a institution like that uh, to preserve the history of Fort Dallas. And I think it is just a, a wonderful addition to the city. I'm so pleased to be a part of kind of getting it livened up again and making it a people place and uh, lo looking forward to getting open. And when we are, please come up and take a look. I'd love to show you around. Thank, Thank you again. You very much. Thank you very much, Cal. Um, I'm still looking forward to having my 10 year old grandson come up and volunteer. You, hey, you know, I'm, really, I'm, really, really I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to do volunteer shout outs this week. So okay. okay. Anybody else have any comments? <clears throat> Okay, with that, again, congratulations and uh, uh, congratulations to your board of directors as well. I'm sure they had a, a big part in making this thing successful. Definitely, and thank you again very much. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is employee recognition. And um, I'll be saying a few words, but first I'd like to turn it over to our human resources director, Daniel Hunter, for a staff report, Daniel. 
Thank you, Mayor Mays. Uh, so the employee recognition program has been around for uh, many years. And in 2018, the city council adopted resolution 18-028, uh, amending the program. And uh, in large part, that was uh, one to get larger buy-in from uh, not just employees, but also city council. Previously, there was uh, some understanding among employees that only supervisors could nominate employees. And now all city employees could nominate their peers. Uh, city council members can nominate employees. So it's a much broader pool to uh, get nominations from. Uh, this year is actually the first year we received any nominations. Uh, so uh, actually it was 2020 for uh, the nominations. And we received eight nominations. Uh, the Mayor Mays, myself, and City Manager Julie Kruger looked through the nominations and uh, selected uh, the winners of the awards. We didn't have any uh, any nominations for Innovative Thinker this year. Uh, we did have nominations for uh, Customer Service and uh, Team Player Award. And the uh, winners of those two awards were unanimous amongst the three of us. And with that, I will turn it over to the mayor. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I would, I think it bears mention the names of the people that were nominated because it was a very difficult decision uh, for the three of us to make. And I just wanted to mention that the nominations for the excellent customer service award were every police officer was nominated for that award. And also uh, the water distribution operator, Richard Prentice. And um, the winner that was selected, if you want to call him the winner, it's kind of like the Academy Awards. <laughs> the award goes to um, Maggie Pondo of the library, and she is here with us tonight. And um, the, the nominations for Team Player Award were Transportation Division Manager David Mills, again, every police officer, IT Specialist Peter Bradley, Equipment Operator Nathan Munson, Safety... Um, the library technical assistant, excuse me, I just mentioned Maggie, she was nominated for this as well. Finance director, Angie Wilson, and water distribution operator, again, Richard Prentice, who was also nominated for the excellent customer service award. And after a lot of deliberation and a very difficult decision, the award for the best uh, team player for the city is uh, Bailey Volk, our safety officer, who is also here with us tonight. So I see Bailey holding up his certificate which he's obviously very proud of. Uh, Maggie, if you can un, uh, is there any way you can put your video on? I'm trying to, I apologize. I am here, hold on. Okay, and I, I trust you're also holding up your, oh. there you are. Okay, yes. you wanna hold up your There we go. There thank she you. Is. Okay, well, thank you very much and a job well done to both Maggie and Bailey, thank you. How about a nice hand? For you guys keep up the good work. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, third on the agenda, or uh, third under presentations and proclamations is a proclamation declaring Red Cross Month. And I'm going to read this uh, very quickly. We also have the uh, executive director of the regional Red Cross with us tonight, uh, Nadine McCrindle. But I just, I'd like to read this proclamation. The Red Cross American Red Cross is a humanitarian organization that eases people's suffering during life emergencies throughout Oregon, across the United States, and around the world. The Red Cross Cascades region has a long history of helping our neighbors in need by delivering shelter, care, and hope during disasters, making our community safer through providing life-saving blood, teaching skills that save lives, and supporting military, veterans, and their families. Last year in the Cascade region, more than 3,000 volunteers helped the families affected by over 650 home fires by addressing their urgent needs like food and lodging and providing recovery support. Meanwhile, when large disasters like the Oregon wildfires devastated our region, volunteers from our area and all across the country provided 173,489 overnight stays, 387,590 meals and snacks, and 9,955 relief items, emotional support, recovery planning, and other assistance. The Red Cross continues to carry out the organization's 140-year mission of preventing and alleviating suffering. During the trying times of COVID-19 pandemic, 
People have stepped up to help others in need, whether it was responding to this year's record-breaking disasters across the country or rolling up their sleeves to give more than 148,500 units of blood in the Cascades region when our country faced a severe blood shortage. This life-saving work is vital to strengthening our community's resilience. So I, Richard Mays, Mayor of the City of the Dallas, hereby proclaim March of 2021 to be Red Cross Month in the City of the Dallas, Oregon, and encourage all citizens to join in this observance. Um, I, I, I thought I saw, oh, there she is. Ms. McCrindle, welcome to our City Council meeting. Congratulations on the And um, I'd like to um, offer you the opportunity to say a few words to our, to our City Council and citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Mays, and, and good evening, Mayor Mays and councillors. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment this evening and express our gratitude uh, to the City of the Dells for proclaiming March as American Red Cross Month. As you mentioned, my name is Nadine McCrindle and I'm the Executive Director for the Central and Eastern Oregon Chapter of the American Red Cross. Thank you for supporting our mission to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies in our communities. March is a special month for us because it is selected um, to coincide with the birth of our founder, Clara Barton, now 200 years ago. Uh, it was her dedication and care for those in need that became her humanitarian calling and to later start the American Society of the Red Cross. During disasters like the Oregon wildfires, American Red Cross is there taking care of people. We make sure that they have a place, safe place to sleep, they have a meal, emergency relief, supplies, health services, whatever they need. But what you won't always see physically is that we are also providing hope. When people are facing the worst days of their lives, we are there to provide compassion, comfort, and hopefully one day soon, a shoulder to lean on, perhaps even a hug. And this all began with a very determined woman whose legacy continues today. And I thank you for honouring her and all of the volunteers and donors that help to support deliver our life-saving mission each and every day. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for all you guys did, uh, especially during the wild, wildfire situation here. You guys were uh, all over the area and it's, it's much appreciated. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. McCrindle? Okay, once again, thank you very much for coming. And uh, it's nice to put your face with the, uh, yes. the phone calls we've had. And uh, you're welcome to come here anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Item six on the agenda is audience participation. During this portion of the meeting, anyone may speak on any subject which does not later appear on the agenda. Five minutes per person will be allowed. If a person, if a response by the city is requested, the speaker will be referred to the city manager for further action. The issue may appear on a future meeting agenda for city council consideration. Um, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to the city council on anything that is not on the agenda for up to five minutes? And I see one hand up, uh, Mr. Jim Wilcox. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Rich and council people. I, I'm, I really like the fact you're giving out awards, by the way, to your to the city employees, that's that's a great idea. I come to you tonight, tonight with an issue that about 20, uh, 15, 20 years ago, I, I worked with uh, our, our utility um, billing for the city and worked out a little problem there, but another one just recently came up that I wanted to bring to your attention. And I also not just, I don't wanna bring a problem, I wanna bring, a, I think, a reasonable solution. And the problem is many of, most of the landlords, if they haven't received it, will, and I didn't realize I, had one until a friend of mine who's also a landlord uh, brought it to my attention. There's a document that you sign with the city if you have, uh, if you a, a tenant moves and you want the water left on, you sign and say, I'll pick it up when they sign out. Well, the new one, and I don't remember this before, but it also says that if they don't pay the bill, you, the landlord, are stuck with it. I don't want unpaid bills by anybody, but there is no provision to let the landlord know if that bill is unpaid, if it is supposed to be paid by the by the tenant. And the lady sitting with me tonight has had a situation where a tenant moved out, did not pay the last rent, and had over seven months unpaid bills. 
Well, the city water sewer bill is about $105. I'm rounding off. It's that's within a buck, I think. Seven months to that is is ugly. And if you look at what's happening, it's very possible that a, a, a landlord in this in our community, any community in Oregon, could be going 15 months without receiving any rent. And and all a person has to do is say, well, it's COVID related without receiving any rent. And then if they are supposed to whether they are supposed to be paying the water bill or as the landlord took res responsibility, you can have up to 15 months of water bills. The only help that landlords are even being considered for in the legislature is some help if you give up 20% of your income to, to get any, any help on the other 80%. Well, I got news. Are, is anybody on the screen right now willing to give up 20% of their income? I don't see hands going up really quick. Well, the, the landlords are getting beat up ferociously. And I can tell you from my, my livelihood, which is real estate, that there's a lot of homes in the Dallas that are now going from uh, rentals to uh, owner-occupied. That does not help the, the rental situation, does not help our housing situation at all. And every time you add a disincentive to, to being a landlord, you have fewer rentals. So I'm asking the council, I'm not asking you to give up the money and not collect, but what I'm asking is with this policy, this policy is that you add that if, if the city has a tenant that's signed up and it's not, it's not the landlord, the owner, but it's a tenant, and that tenant goes a period of time without paying, that the landlord is, is notified. Right now, the answer my friend got was, well, anytime somebody moves out, you'll have to call the city and see if they owe anything. Holy crap, that's wrong. If you expect us to pay it, tell us up front. So maybe we can do something about it before it gets out of hand. But to just say, uh, we're not gonna do anything to collect, but when the time comes, it's on you, landlord. That is not right. That's absolutely not right. So my suggestion is, okay, you gotta get the bills paid because those that aren't paid, Dave Anderson and, and Angie, we know somebody's gonna pay for them eventually and it's gonna be the other rate payers. And I don't want that to happen either. So I think to, to work a little more closely and, and give the landlords a break, don't just sit back and allow those bills to roll up if a, if a, a tenant is, is responsible for it. Don't let it roll up. Let the landlord know or the property management, whoever. Once they're notified, if they don't pay, I mean, they may not be able to do anything under the state's edicts right now. There's not a hell of a lot they can do, but at least they have some knowledge up front that it's happening. But to, to put it on the landlord to have to call to find out if there's a bill when somebody moves out, no. I think it's a courtesy and a service that you could give to local landlords to keep more landlords being landlords, making rentals available, to not keep it, keep it in the dark until it's a big bad, big bad bill and then spring it on them. So that's what I'm asking. I, I, I get trying to collect it, both of us, and there's another person here with me, um, we don't want unpaid bills either, and we pay them on time. The other solution, but some people don't do this, I build it into my rent so that if they don't pay the rent, I'm still paying the water bill, but at least I know they didn't pay it. Others have it set up to where they only pay rent and the water sewer is something the tenant takes care of. So, but I, I think we need to allow people to do what they want in their rental agreements uh, and not force them because we're gonna surprise them with, with up to a 15 month water bill. Okay. And I know that the city is in a terrible position. They can't shut off the water to, to collect it, to help force the collection. So I'm asking notification as, as a reasonable, uh, a reasonable thing to, to work through this. Done. Okay. Thank you. Anybody got any comments or questions for Mr. Wilcox? If I could have, I have the other person here with me and she would like to speak to it. It was, oh, I'm sorry, first of all, Jim Wilcox, 416 West 7th, and I know you need that for the minutes. And Kathleen, if you'd identify yourself. Kathleen McFarland, 8320 Walton Ray Road. Uh, I have several duplexes in the Dalles, um, and the they're all fixed up, metered separate, so the uh, each tenant can take care of that. If this is the policy, I, I find myself having to raise a security deposit immensely to cover the water 
that is unpaid. So their security deposit is also is going to have to go up to cover that. So I just want you to make aware of that, that that was when I called the city to ask about the water and found out it was $771.64 for this tenant. I asked her what to do and she said, you need to build that into your security deposit. But if you're wanting to make it easier for people to rent and that is a problem everywhere. If you're forcing landlords to increase their security department deposit up to say $2,2500 and then the person has to come up with a month's rent of $800 to $1,500 to $2,000. You're taking people out of they don't have the cash to rent. Okay. Help us out here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, last call for any questions or comments. Councilor Long Curtis. Yes. Um, I was, Angie, I'm wondering if this is a problem because of COVID, whereas before people got turned off after only a couple of months. Is that what's going on or is this something different? Is COVID related, but the city. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Misunderstood. Um, Darcy, so the letter that they received in the mail was um, an update to um, a, pla a, a, a place that was put in um, place, a placeholder that was put in place um, a few years ago. Right. So we were just um, updating our records and um, that. Um, policy was put in place that if a tenant doesn't pay their water bill, then it does go on to the, um, the, the owner of the occupied um, house. And what we do is typically is we do try to collect from um, all tenants and it's the same process for an owner. And we eventually um, do door hangers. We do phone tree, phone calls. We do late notices, attempts to to shut off, and then we do the phone. Then we do do shutoffs, um, even if they're a tenant. Even at this time, we still do shutoffs. And then at that point in time, that gives that person the ability to call and say, if, ask if say if they need assistance or if they need to pay put on a payment plan or anything like that. So right now, the city works really hard to not try to turn off any any tenant or owner. And we do try to set up um, where we are giving out um, grants for water assistance or putting them on payment plans or whatever we can do to help them. Um, we're also referring them over to MCAC, which MCAC is offering assistance for utility payments, electrical payments, rent assistance. And so we do try to provide as much as we can. Um, as far as us not notifying the landlord, we, we can send out landlord copies if that's something that they request to have. And um, we can send that out where they will be receiving that, um, that bill also on a monthly basis. And that's how the process has been. Okay. They are sending? Uh, we, whoops. Jim, um, let, let, let me just follow up with, does anybody have any other questions for our finance director? Okay. Um, I think the point is taken, uh, Mr. Wilcox, that um, that it, it, it's, a, it's a question of not whether or not they're paying or, or making sure that they're shut off. It's a question of notifying the, the landlord when one of their tenants is in arrears. So I believe that's the issue, so. Um, Let's see, Jim, you're muted. I'll give you just, I'll just give you 30 more seconds, okay? Jim? I would be willing to work with Angie to try and work out something so it doesn't create a whole clerical mess for them. Uh, I, don't, I don't think every month is what we're asking. Okay. We're just asking at the time it, it gets down the road and they're almost into the shutoff that, that the landlord knows before it gets, you know, completely out of hand. Right. And okay, any, other, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Okay, thank you very thank you very much, Jim. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. McFarland. Okay, now item seven is uh, city manager's report. Now, watch the cool part about these meetings. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. I do not have a report for this evening's meeting. Well, I have to agree with Mr. Wilcox. That is a, that is a very cool part about this meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody, uh, let's see, next to the city attorney's report, Mr. Kara. Thank you, Honorable Mayor Mays. Uh, also, nothing to report for this evening, so I don't know how much fun Mr. Wilcox will be having. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, City Council reports. Uh, first one I see is uh, the Council Runyon. I've been continuing to uh, tune into the League of Oregon Cities meetings generally on Friday. There have been a couple of others and, and others to come, but uh, I will detail uh, all that to Izetta as appropriate, pretty much the same ones. Thank you. Councilor Long Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my report uh, tonight is about the winter warming shelters. Um, it, today is March 8th and those will be closing on March 31st. So that's about three and a half weeks. Um, we have some uh, mainstream vouchers for housing that have come through as part of the COVID. And so we're able to get people into housing if we could find housing. Um, that is the problem right now is that um, I've got a bunch of people with vouchers but no place to move them into. Um, other than that, everything seems to be going well. Uh, the winter warming shelter worked just like we wanted it to, and we've got quite a few people in there with serious medical issues that probably wouldn't have made it through the winter. And we've got some other people that were able to get their lives together, either with medical things being taken care of or finding housing or uh, just basically having a place to be. So thank you to city council for that. Thank you. Uh, Council Randall. Thank you, Mayor. Um, last week I received an email and a newsletter from the Goldendale Energy Storage Project. Uh, other members may have also received this email, but uh, I thought it was worth mentioning tonight. Um, I've heard rumors of this project for a couple of years now. Um, this is the first confirmation I've seen that it's a uh, serious proposal. Um, what it is, is a uh, proposed $2 billion pump storage hydroelectric facility to be constructed at the former Goldendale aluminum plant, which is about 30 miles east of the Dalles. Now it's estimated this will generate 3,000, I'll say that again, 3,000 jobs during its four year construction schedule. This is huge. Uh, the impact on our community, both positive and negative, will be substantial, especially if it coincides with the proposed expansion of, uh, of Google. Um, we haven't seen this level of construction activity since the freeways and the dams were built back in the 50s and 60s. Um, I encourage everyone to check out their website. It's the Goldendale Energy Storage Project. Uh, it's mostly promotional, but there's good information and there's some conceptual drawings of the project. And um, anyone who's familiar with the, uh, with the proposed project site uh, will recognize immediately the, um, the enormous scope of this project. And that's all I have. Thank you, Council Randall. I know they reached out to me about a year ago, and then I, I never heard anything until recently. I believe uh, some other councilors have been contacted. Are they planning on having any public meetings out here that you know of in the near future? None that I know of. And, and like I say, I haven't seen anything in the news. Um, that yeah. This is the first, like I say, the first confirmation that I've seen, you know, solid uh, evidence that this is a serious proposal. But yeah, I assume that there's going to be more announcements, possibly some meetings. Uh, it looks like the website is kind of set up to, like I say, to promote the project. So maybe they'll be seeking some input and some comments on that. Okay, thank Mayor you. Mays, they uh, have requested to do a presentation to the council in an upcoming meeting. I think it's the 12th of April. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Grossman. Um, before we get to, um, let's see, Councillor McLaughlin and Councillor uh, Richardson. Um, I, 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 I think I neglected to back um, an audience participation. I think I cut it off after Mr. Wilcox. So after Councilor Richardson and Councilor McLaughlin give their report, I'd like to open it back up to the, uh, to the audience participation to see if there's anyone else who would like to ask questions or comment. So with that, let's go to Councilor McLaughlin. I have just one thing tonight and that's uh... At the airport, um, one task that was left to be uh, accomplished was to complete an FAA document uh, to resolve the city or the uh, Dallasport water rights. And that was due last Friday. And I just assumed that that was done. And that's the only thing I have to report. Thank you, Council Richardson. Thank you, Mayor Mays. Uh, since last city council meeting, several uh, little things, a number of 
constituent emails and conversations, mostly regarding people's concerns about Google. I have been um, participating or, or zooming into the Chamber of Commerce weekly government affairs presentations. And uh, I'm actually up this Thursday at seven to make one of those. So uh, those are public meetings. So if anyone is inclined to be up at seven and, and listen or play stump a counselor, I guess that's an opportunity. Um, I attended last Friday the 26th, I guess a week ago, Friday the 26th, a, the, the first meeting this year of the um, community outreach team. I need to do some follow up with that. And uh, I think that's about it. I, I should say thank you, Mayor Mays, for also, I did have a walking meeting with you uh, a week ago Monday to look at some potential urban renewal project sites. And I appreciate your time in uh, doing some orientation there. Thank you, uh, Councilor Richardson. Um, I also attended a county board meeting um, last week, a beautification committee meeting on that same day, March 3rd and an economic development committee meeting of, of Boston County on March the 4th. Um, with that, uh, let's move back to audience participation. Um, my apologies for um, cutting out of there too quickly. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the city council uh, for up to five minutes? Uh, I see uh, Mr. Murray. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Steve Murray. I live at 2645 East 11th Street in the Dalles. And uh, I was wondering what the city's response to uh, losing the appeal to Luba over the, the development between 10th and 12th uh, and what is it, Richardson? Richmond. Richmond. Uh, based on codes that weren't clear and uh, I can't think of the word, but does the city have any plans to rewrite codes so that at least they're not gonna lose any more appeals based on unclear codes? <clears throat> well, that question cannot be answered at this time. We just got the decision uh, recently, and I know that the city council will be meeting soon, uh, probably in executive session to discuss that very issue. And as far as the, un the, um, the codes, I would not necessarily agree that the codes were unclear. Um, that is again, something that we're gonna be discussing and, and directing staff to rewrite or to clarify if we, if we, think, so, if we think that is necessary. Um, would anybody on the staff like to, uh, add anything to what I just said? Mayor Mays, I don't have anything to add. Um, we, we will respond to any direction you have about that. But with regard to the development, we'll be moving forward consistent with the direction we received from the state and, uh, and moving forward with that development in the coming weeks. Yeah. Thank you, Director Cannon. Um, will you take the occasion maybe to, uh, you know, you and I had a conversation today and Apparently they've already started uh, putting up a fence and doing some other work out there. And just so everyone knows, uh, apparently what they're doing out there is, is completely uh, legal and permitted um, to do some minor light work out there. Is that, isn't that correct? Yes, Mayor Mays. Um, the, the developer did come in last week to obtain a, a, a permit to place a perimeter fence around the site. So that has occurred. I learned of that today. So the permit was issued last week or the week prior. So that's happened. There is a little bit of um, earthwork happening on the site. It is not to a degree, we went out and looked at the site and took some photos this afternoon. It is not to a degree that would warrant a, what we call a physical constraints permit. So um, that it, a little more earthwork needs to occur for that to happen. We did have a good opportunity this afternoon to talk to the applicant and just about what those parameters are. So I guess at this point, I feel confident that the applicant developer knows um, what he needs to do in order to obtain the proper permits and knows the limits um, of what can happen out on the site for now. Certainly we invite uh, feedback from folks in the public if they wanna reach out to our planning staff 
we would answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. So Mr. Murray, uh, I'm sorry, you can't, we can't answer your first question until later. I'm sure some um, information on your first question will be coming out very shortly. Okay, well, the second question I have then is since the original denial of the permit was based on uh, the potential safety, uh, lack of safety on, on nearby roads, has the city looked at uh, bringing the roads up to a, a safer standard uh, since that was part of your, your uh, appeal was the roads weren't safe enough. So do you have any plans to upgrade safety along 10th and 12th and Richmond? No, I, know, I know that they have to do it around their, their uh, development, but 10th and 12th have a ways to go before they're, they're brought up to standard, I think. Right, I, I know what you're saying and, and you're right about that. Um, but this is the first time really the city council has been together since the Lube decision came down. So just like with your first question, we're not in a position where we can answer that at this time, but uh, information will be coming out shortly on that, okay? Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure you guys were thinking about this stuff. It's hard not to think about it. <laughs> thank you. All right, any, thank you. Any other comments or questions about this subject? Anybody? Okay, is there any other member of the audience that would like to address the city council for up to five minutes on any subject that is not on the agenda? Is that another hand raised? Yes. Karen I, Murray? Yeah, I just have a quick question. When is the deadline to appeal to the Court of Appeals if if someone was gonna do that? For we don't know, we don't know like, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think anybody else it does except maybe our attorney. And I'm not sure our attorney can answer that until we have a chance to discuss this as a group. Um, you don't think we've missed that though, do you? I I doubt it. I I really don't I really doubt it. Mr. Kara, do you have anything you could say that would be enlightening or Ms. Cannon? Go ahead. Mayor Mays, um, I don't have the document in front of me that tells me when that um, appeal date is up. I believe it's next week. Um, I think it's March 17th. It's 21 days from the date of decision. So whenever that decision was issued, 21 days from that date. Okay, and thank I you. think I calculated and I believe it might have been in or around uh, March that sounds, 17th. That sounds right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Last call. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to item and the consent agenda. Items of a routine and non-controversial nature are placed on the consent agenda to allow the city council to spend its time and energy on the important items and issues. Any councilor may request an item be pulled from the consent agenda and be considered separately. Items pulled from the consent agenda will be placed on the agenda at the end of the act action items section. Tonight, we only have one item on the consent agenda, and that's the approval of the February 22nd regular city council minutes. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Councilor Long Curtis. Mr. Mayor, I will move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor Mayor. Uh... I will, this council run and I'll move to second that. It's been moved by Councilor Long Curtis and seconded by Councilor Runyon to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item 11 is discussion. Uh, 11A is further discussion of the Google Strategic Investment Program. Um, as you all probably know, the, uh, the um, uh, negotiating team negotiated a tentative agreement with Google. It was presented at the joint city county meeting at the county's board meeting on uh, February the um, 8th, I believe it was. No, the, the um, 17th. And then it was brought before the city council at our meeting on the 22nd of February. Um, the, meeting, or the 
The agreement itself is still being worked on by the attorneys from both sides. And for that reason, we don't expect that the, that the, the agreement will be approved at, uh, as we had hoped on, on March 22nd. So last week on the 17th of March, the county board uh, held another discussion and entertained some questions from audience members and from county commissioners. And those questions were uh, answered. And now I would like to conduct this particular part of the meeting similar to what the county did last week. And that is to open it up first to uh, city council members who would like to ask a question or make a comment. Then we'll open it up to the audience and then uh, we'll come back to the city council for any wrap up. So with that, I wanna also uh, let everyone know that we do have three county officials with us tonight uh, that help us answer any questions. That would be the county administrator, Tyler Stone, uh, Administrative Di uh, Services Director, Matthew Klebs, and the County Assessor, Jill Amory. Thank you very much to Jill, Matthew, and Tyler for uh, attending our meeting uh, on this subject. So with that, let's open it up to the City Council. Uh, does anybody on the Council have any questions they would like to ask regarding this project at this point? <clears throat> or comments? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, Council Mr. Richardson. Mayor, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Council Richardson. Sorry, I I trust everyone had a chance to see their email from uh, Matthew. I just wanted to follow up on this. I know there was some question or, or a number of questions, basically going to the point or the the uh, uh, the query. Does this deal, you know, tentative deal? Um, you know, is it a good one? Are we have we negotiated a good deal in comparison to other communities? And um, there was some discussion at the county meeting that this was difficult to compare. You know, every deal has its own parameters and um, various aspects, so they're not um, precisely comparable. And yet, if you do look at um, the email that uh, we received this week, you see that. Across the board in Oregon, I think over the last 15 or so years, the average is something like 30% uh, of value of a large industrial project um, gets paid on. You know, not, they're not paying 100% of the value of their various projects that get entered into SIPs or inter enterprise zone, but up to and about 30% on average. And the current deal, it's kind of a two-part deal and our percent has been negotiated to 50 and 60 percent so um that's that's not 100 it's still quite a break but it's it's um, stacks up pretty well when you look at other deals around the state thank you counselor for pointing that out um yeah, I had a chance too to look at that table that was sent out and um, I would agree with you that I think your observation is absolutely correct. Um, anybody else? Okay, at this point, I'd like to open it up to the general audience. If there's anyone that would like to ask a question on the Google project or make a comment, now's the time to either raise your hand. I can see uh, about 25 25 um, squares on my on my screen, and I see there's 26 people in attendance. So uh, chances are I'll be able to see if you'd like to identify yourself and, and ask a question. Anybody? Mayor Mays, this is Roger Nichols. Yes, sir. Please uh, identify yourself, your address. And, uh, um, I'm at 1617 Oregon Street. Thank you. And my question is, I would like to get some more information about the proposed aquifer adjustments that the 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 city is proposing to deal with the increased demand for water. And I know that you have an excellent expert on the line. Well, as we mentioned last last meeting, uh, Mr. Nichols. Uh, those details on what's on the water situation with Google is currently being negotiated and will be released in a, at a public meeting um, probably in the next couple of months. 
Um, other than that, I don't really not sure what we can say about it unless, unless Mr. Anderson has something he'd like to add to that or but those details are currently being worked out. And the only thing we can say at this point is that we're ensuring that whatever we do with Google is not going to impact water rates, nor will it impact the water supply to the rest of the city. We know that much. I guess my question is to Mr. Anderson, assuming that we have that this passes and everything goes through, what happens if we have a drought year? Will there be enough overhead to protect the water supply for the city of the Dallas? I, ahead, I can, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I didn't know you were gonna speak. Go ahead, Julie. We need to save that for the appropriate meeting, which is not tonight. Tonight is about the proposed agreement with Google Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Questions or comments? Um, Sarah Mall, did you have a hand raised or? No, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, um, we'll cut it off at there, uh, last call. Comments, questions for about the Google project? One, going once, okay. twice, three times. Councilor okay. Long Curtis. Oh, Councilor Long Curtis. Sorry. Yep. So just to clarify, in case some people aren't reading between the lines, um, Mr. Nichols' question about whether the agreement affected that or not, we're saying it it does not affect it. All the this vote tonight and what we're discussing is only about the compensation that we're discussing between the city and Google if they build something. So maybe people are kind of feeling like it's backwards, like they want to know what they're going to build and then how much we're going to get. But just so the public understands, this is um, how much we would get if they build. And then whether or not they build and what it looks like, that's the next step, separate meeting, separate vote. I would say that's very accurate. And I think uh, people should understand too that uh, we don't know, they could build one data center, they could build two, uh, but until this agreement is passed, uh, there's gonna be, there can't be any consideration of the water or the numerous other things that Google has to go through in order to begin building one or two data centers. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, um, I'd like to, uh, Mr. Klebs, is there anything that you would like to say, or let's, let's go back to the city council, any other closing comments or questions? Anybody? Councilor Runyon, are you, uh, did you want to say uh, something? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I was just, there's something covering up my microphone. <laughs> anyway, I love Zoom. It's my favorite thing to do in the whole wide world. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Klebs if he was able to follow up with uh, Mr. Jacobson from the Mid Columbia Fire and Rescue Board and and get the clarification that uh, we discussed after Mr. Jacobs had left the meeting? Um, I, I have yet to follow up with him yet. We're still pending um, the draft of the legal agreement to confirm that the information I provide to him is accurate, but it is certainly still on my list of things to do. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, for my benefit, if not anybody else's, could you repeat, repeat what the question was? I don't, I don't, what was? Part of his, part of his question was about the um, gap payment and um, its process. I see, yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Okay, anybody else? Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Klebs, Mr. Stone, Ms. Amory, thank you very much for attending as well. And we will close this portion of the meeting. Item 12 is executive session. Bear with me, I have a script to read. The City Council of the City of the Dalles will now meet in executive session in accordance with ORS 192.6602H to consult with council concerning the, excuse me, the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or litigation likely to be filed and ORS 192.6602D to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body 
to carry on labor negotiations. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session concerning pending litigation. Representatives of the news media will not be allowed to attend the executive session concerning labor negotiations. Representative of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the discussions or deliberations during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced, period. No decision may be made in executive session. At the end of the executive session, we will return to open session and welcome the audience back into the room. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna adjourn this portion of the meeting and we'll see you on the other side in, in executive session. Thank you very much to everyone.